So welcome everybody uh, this evening. Um, my name is Dokus van der Maren. Um, am I, um, can everyone hear me fine? Perfect. Okay, um, my name is Dokus and I'm the curator of the public program here at the Witte Witt. Um, we are here together for a public reading by Dora Garcia. Um, as part of the project on reconciliation that she initiated uh, a few years ago. Um, the reading is part of our current group show, uh, a group show on the third floor, um, which is a, a show on the, with artists and on the theme of epistolarity, um, or uh, letter writing and letter exchange, um, which is uh, curated uh, partly by Sophia Hernman as John Kui, our new director, who uh, unfortunately is ill and cannot be with today, and by Samuel Salamakers, who is uh, who's with us today in the back. Um, tonight's reading will present a uh, selection of letters by um, Hannah Arendt and uh, Martin Heidegger, um, with a correspondence span spanning over 50 years of letters between the two, uh, who are uh, arguably uh, two of the most important uh, philosophers of the 20th century. Um, after the reading, we will have a uh, with us today, Dr. Tina Rahimi, um, who will give us a presentation to give some context on the two philosophers and who they were. Um, and we will have, after that, some time to discuss uh, any questions we have with uh, Tina or with Lola or with the performers. Um, but before that, um, the reading as performed by Melissa, maybe soon, and Peter Ars. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I, I didn't even ask you, how do we pronounce your name? Madison and Peter Ars. Thank you. Letter number one. On the 10th of February, 1925, Martin Heidegger wrote to Hannah Arendt. Dear Miss Arendt, I must come to you this evening and speak to your heart. Everything should be simple and clear and pure between us. Only then will we be worthy of having been allowed to meet. You are my pupil and I your teacher, but that is only the occasion for what has happened to us. I will never be able to call you mine, but from now on you will belong in my life, and it shall grow with you. We never know what we can become for others through our being, but surely some reflection can make clear how destructive or inhibiting the effect we have might be. The path your young life will take is hidden. We must be reconciled to that. And my loyalty to you shall only help you remain true to yourself. You have lost your disquiet, which means you have found the way to your innermost, purest, feminine essence. Someday you will understand and be grateful, not to me, that this visit to my office hour was the decisive step back from the path toward a terrible solitude of academic research, which only man can endure, and then only when he has been given the burden, as well as the frenzy, of being productive. Be happy. That is now my wish for you. Only when you are happy will you become a woman who can give happiness and around whom all is happiness, security, repose, reverence and gratitude to life. And only in that way will you be properly pre prepared for what the university can and should give you. That is the way of genuineness and seriousness but not in the forced academic activity of many of your sect. Activity that one day somehow comes apart, leaving them helpless and untrue to themselves. For it is at the point when individual intellectual work begins that the initial preservation of one's innermost womanly essence becomes decisive. We have been allowed to meet. We must hold that as a gift in our innermost being 
and avoid deforming it through self-deception about the purity of living. We must not think of ourselves as soulmates, something no one ever experiences. I cannot and do not want to separate your loyal eyes and dear figure from your pure trust, the honor and goodness of your girlish essence. But that makes the gift of our friendship a commitment we must grow with. And it prompts me to ask you forgiveness for having forgotten myself briefly during our walk. But just once I would like to be able to thank you and with a kiss on your pure brow, take the honor of your being into my work. Be happy, good girl. Your M.H. <laughs> Letter number three. On February 27, 1925, Martin Heidegger wrote the following letter to Hannah Arendt. Dear Hannah, the demonic struck me. The silent prayer of your beloved hands and your shining brow enveloped it in a womanly transfiguration. Nothing like it has ever happened to me. In the rainstorm on the way home, you are even more beautiful and great. I would have liked to wander with you for nights on end. Take this little book as a token of my thanks. Think of it also as a symbol of this semester. Please, Hannah, give me a few more words. I cannot let you go like this. You will be very busy before your trip. Just a little and not beautiful writing. As long as you write, all that matters is that you write. Your M. I am looking forward to seeing your mother. 21st, 22nd, May 1925. So I have to be available for unanticipated meetings in the evening. Hence, it will be hard for us to see each other this week. In any case, definitely Tuesday the 26th. <coughs> You'll still be here, won't you? But only after 9 o'clock. I will also bring you the letter from Husserl then. Destroy this note. Letter number 42, uh, Heidelberg. 22nd of April, 1928. The following <coughs> letter is written by Hannah Arendt to Martin Heidegger. So, you aren't coming now. I think I understand, but still have been anxious in the last few days. Suddenly overcome be an almost baffingly urgent fear. What I want to tell you is nothing but, at heart, a very frank assessment of the situation. I love you as I did on the first day. You know that. And I have always known it, even before this reunion. The path you showed me is longer and more difficult than I thought. It requires a long life in its entirety. The solitude of this path is self-chosen and is the only way of living given me. But the desolation that fate has kept in store not only would have taken from me the strength to live in the world, only you have a right to know this, because you have always known it. And I think that even where I finally remain silent, I will never be untruthful. I always give as much as anyone wants from me, and the path itself is nothing but a commitment our love makes me responsible for. I would lose my right to live if I lost my love for you, but I would lose this love and its reality if I shirked the responsibility it forces on me. Quote, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. H. Letter number 43, 1928. Hannah Arendt writes to Martin Heidegger. 
Dear Martin, you will probably have already heard about me from other random sources. That takes the naivety of the message from me, but not to trust that our last reunion in Heidelberg once more newly and gratifying strengthened. So, I am turning to you today with the same security and with the same request. Do not forget me, and do not forget how much and how deeply I know that our love has become the blessing of my life. This knowledge cannot be shaken, not even today, when, as a way out of my restlessness, I have found home and sense of belonging with someone about whom you might understand it least of all. I often hear things about you, but always with the peculiar reserve and indirectness that is simply part of speaking the famous name that is something I can hardly recognize. And I would indeed so like to know, almost tormentingly so, how are you doing, what you are working on, and how Freiburg is treating you. I kiss your brow and eyes, your Hannah. Letter number 44, Hannah Arendt writes to Martin Heidegger, September 1930. Martin, when I saw you today, forgive me for how I reacted. But at that moment, the image of how you and Günther would stand together at the window flashed through my mind, and how I would be alone on the platform, unable to avoid the diabolical clarity of what I had seen. Forgive me. So many things that had left me utterly confused came together. Not just, as always, how the sight of you always rekindles awareness of my life's clearest and most urgent continuity of the continuity of our, please let me say it, love. But I had already stood before you a few seconds. You had actually already seen me. You had briefly looked up, and you did not recognize me. When I was a small child, that was the way my mother once stupidity and playfully frightened me. I had read the fairy tale about a dwarf nose, whose nose gets so long nobody recognizes him anymore. My mother pretended that it had happened to me. I still vividly recall the blind mirror terror with which I kept crying, but I am your child, I am your Hannah. That is what it was like today. And then when the train was about to leave, and it was just as I had imagined moments before, and so, it seems, had wanted. You two up there, and me alone, completely powerless. As always, nothing was left for me but to let it happen, and wait, wait, wait. Letter 45, winter 1932-33. Martin Heidegger wrote to Hannah Arendt. Dear Hannah, the rumors that are upsetting you are slanders that are perfect matches for other experiences I have endured over the last few years. I cannot very well exclude Jews from the seminar invitations, not least because I have not had a single seminar invitation in the last four semesters. That I supposedly don't say hello to Jews is such a malicious piece of gossip that in any case, I will have to take note of it for the future. As a clarification of how I behave towards Jews, here are the following facts. I am on sabbatical this winter semester, and thus in the summer, I announced well in advance that I wanted to be left alone and would not be accepting projects and the like. The man who comes anyway and urgently wants to write a dissertation is a Jew. The man who comes to see me every month to report on a large work in progress, neither a dissertation nor a habilitation project, is also a Jew. 
The man who sent me substantial text for urgent reading a few weeks ago is a Jew. The two fellows of the Notgemeinschaft, whom I helped get accepted in the last three semesters, are Jews. The man who, with my help, got a stipend to go to Rome, Rome is a Jew. Whoever wants to call that a raging anti-Semitism is welcome to do so. Beyond that, I am now just as much an anti-Semite in university issues as I was 10 years ago in Marburg, where, because of this anti-Semitism, I even earned Jacob's House and Friedländer's support. To say absolutely nothing about my personal relationships with Jews, for example, Hussars, Misch, Kassirer, and others. And above all of it, cannot touch my relationship to you. For a long while, I have been quite withdrawn in general, not least because my work has been met by hopeless incomprehension but also on account of some less than pleasant personal experiences that have resulted from my teaching. In any case, I have long since given up expecting any sort of gratitude or even just decency from so-called disciples. Beyond that, I am cheerfully at work, which is becoming increasingly difficult, and wish you all the best. Letter number 48, Hannah Arendt writes to Martin Heidegger from Wiesbaden, Alexandrastrasse 68, on the 9th of February 1950. From the moment I left the house and got into the car, I have been writing this letter. And now, late at night, I cannot write after all. I am using a typewriter because my fountain pen is broken and my handwriting has become Ill illegible. This evening and this morning are the confirmation of an entire life, a confirmation that, when it come down to it, was never expected. When the waiter spoke your name, I had not actually expected you, had not received the letter after all. It was as if time suddenly stood still. Then, all at once, I became aware of something I would not have confessed before, neither to myself, nor to you, nor to anyone. How, after Friedrich had given me the address, the power of the impulse had mercifully saved me from committing the only really inexcusable act of infidelity and in forfeiting my life. But the one thing you should know, as we have had relatively little to do with each other after all, and that not as openly as we might have, if I had done it, then it would only have been out of pride, that is, out of sheer crazy stupidity, not for reasons. I came without knowing what your wife expected of me. I had read the letter in the car, half asleep. If I had known, I never would have refused for a second. My original refusal was based entirely on what, after all, had also been hinted at by the mention of German woman, and on what I had been told that very afternoon at tea. Please do not misunderstand. It's all the same to me personally. I have never considered myself a German woman, and have long since stopped considering myself a Jewish woman. I feel just like what I am now. After all, the girl from abroad. I was and am shaken by the honesty and urgency of the reproach. But I said, maybe, out of a sudden feeling of solidarity with her, and out of a sudden surge of sympathy. Objectively, I should add that I did not, of course, <coughs> remain silent just as a matter of discretion, but also as a matter of pride but also as a matter of love for you, not to make anything more difficult than it must be. <coughs> I left Marger, Marburg exclusively for your sake. Off the beaten track is lying on my bedside table. I have begun the Heraclitus with great pleasure. 
I am delighted with the Polatadeina. It is entirely successful. I was lucky in a way. When I arrived here, I had to send the car back along with the chauffeur, so now I have two days to rest. I can put everything off and definitely come on March 4 or 5th. I'm flying to Berlin on Saturday, where I will stay until Friday. Address Berlin Dahlem Park Hotel. Then Saturday, Sunday here and, and on to the British zone. If you could come here next Saturday, Sunday, very northern, my treat. As you do not read journals and only read books from the end, here are a few pages torn out for you, actually not just for you, but also for your wife, Hannah. Letter number 49, the 10th of February 1950, Hannah Arendt writes to Mrs. Heidegger. Dear Mrs. Heidegger, Martin's letter just arrived, which made me want to answer you right away. I am glad that I came and that everything has turned out well. There is a guilt that comes from reserve. It has little to do with lack of trust. In the end, it seems to me, Martin and I have probably sinned just as much against each other as against you. This is not an excuse. You did not expect one, after all, and I could not provide one, either. You broke the spell, and I thank you for that with all my heart. I could not have realized that you expected something from me, because I did things later in connection with this affair that were so much worse that I did not remember the early things at all. You see, when I left Marburg, I was quite firmly determined never to love a man again, and then later I married, somehow indifferent as to whom I was marrying without being in love. Because I thought I had everything completely under control and that everything was at my disposal. Precisely, in fact, because I expected nothing for myself. All this changed only when I met my current husband, but that is a different story. Please believe one thing, what was and surely still is between us was never personal, at least not that I am aware of. You never made a secret of your convictions, after all, nor do you today not even be. Now, as a result of those convictions, a conversation. Letter 64, Meskich, May 16, 1950. Martin Heidegger wrote to Hannah Arendt. Oh, you, most trusted one, if you were here, yet you are here, but I would like to use your words to invoke you here. Put a great ocean between us. Language contains my thoughts on language. It is not philosophy. But you remember on a walk in the valley, we talked about language. You are right about reconciliation and revenge. I have been thinking about that a great deal. In all this thinking, you are so near. And then I dream. You would like living here, after all. Walking down the interlocking forest paths, bearing the silent rain of things, and existing amid the ultimate joy as it is, I have only your picture. But in my heart, your heart, and longing and the hope that we might grow together, even more simply in pure innocence. The second picture is different, but you ought to have it with you too. Be at home abroad, you, most trusted one. You who have returned and arrived, Hannah, you. The following page was enclosed with the letter. I will probably have to return to Freiburg on May 22. Send your reply there in the necessary hermeneutic to my letters from here. I would like <coughs> to know which of the pictures you like better. Then you shall have a more beautiful print of the one you choose. 
And if you should have another picture sometime, enclose it. We are so far apart. If you want to give the Heraclitus to Tilik, I would be glad. But otherwise, the lecture should not circulate. Before I left Pible, I received Broch's The Death of Virgil. Do you still have your review? Here, I have been able to gather my thoughts quite well, but it all becomes so thin when put into words. I have Jasper's introduction with me. During my visit to Heidelberg, you told me the story in the little house, you, M. Have you read it? Perhaps you can give me a brief explanation of cipher writing. Another page was enclosed with the letter. To you, you, Hannah, the real and between Jasper and Heidegger is only you. It is beautiful to be an Anne, but it is the secret of the goddess. It happens before all communication. It rings from the deep sound of the U in you, M. Letter number 89, uh, on October 28, 1960. Um, Hannah writes to Martin. Dear Martin, I have instructed the publisher to send you a book of mine. I would like to say a word about it. You will see that the book does not contain a dedication. If things had ever worked out properly between us, and I mean between, that is, neither you nor me, I would have asked you if I might dedicate it to you. It came directly out of the first Freiburg days and hence owes practically everything to you in every respect. As things are, I did not think it was possible, but wanted at least to mention the bare fact that to you in one way or another. All the best. Letter number 97 on 24th of September 1967, Hannah. Hannah writes to Martin. Dear Martin, Kant's thesis about being is a marvelous work. As I read it on the return trip, it fits so beautifully into the memory of what you read me and of our conversations. I am enclosing an aphorism by Kafka that I thought of when you mentioned what is outside space and time, and then in the context in the first paragraph about the future as what is on its way and what reaches us. For surely, the two opponents in Kafka's parable are the past and the future. I am also enclosing a page there were two of. Perhaps you can complete another copy of it. I do have questions, only one of which, however, is, however, is urgent, probably a peripheral one on page 23. What is real in each case, case is what is real about something possible, and that it is what is real points back, in the end, to something necessary. Are you saying that yourself or supplementing count. If what is real is the reality of something possible, then how can it point to what is necessary? Do we think of reality, the unavoidable, undeniable, as necessary because we see no other way to reconcile ourselves with it? I do not know anything more precise about the publishing issue. Glenn Gray wrote, wants to call in the next few days. It seems that nothing has been decided yet. For the time being, I have not called weak because I want to talk to Gray first. It should not seem like I am interfering. I am happy and grateful that I was in Freiburg. All the very best for the coming year. Regards to Elfriede, Heinrich sends his regards. As always, Hannah. Enclosure. He has two opponents. The first presses him from behind, from the origin. The second blocks his way forward. He fights with both. Actually, the first supports him in his fight with the second, for he wants to push him forward. And in the same way, the second supports him in his fight with the first. 
for he is pushing him back after all. But that is only how it is in theory, for it is not just the two opponents who are there, he is there too, and who really know what his intentions are. At any rate, his dream is that at some point, in an unobserved moment, a night as dark as any ever was put, surely be necessary, he will leap out of the fighting line and because of his fighting experience be installed as the judge of his opponents and as they fight with each other. Kafka. He notes from the year 1920, volume 5, 287. Letter number 127. New York, 27th of November, 1970. Hannah Arendt writes to Martin Heidegger. Dear Martin, for days, weeks, I have wanted to write you, at least to tell you how much your letter did to me, your sympathy, the time poem as an aid to reflection, together with the other from many, many years ago. Death is in the world's design. Beings, mountain chain. Death will evade what's yours and mine in the falling weight, falling towards silence's star, star of earth, nothing more. I hope I have not quoted it correctly. Don't feel like looking it up. But I cannot write. Perhaps I could speak. I cannot write. It is then one's homeland. In any case, it was the only homeland we were willing to recognize. This tiny micro world where you can always escape from the world and which disintegrates when, in, disintegrates when the other has gone away. I go now and I'm quiet, calm and think away. My thanks to you and Elfried. When will you move into the house? Beside me is the last Seminaire du Thor. La finitude est peut-être la condition de l'existence authentique. I can make plans now, but it would be good to know where you both will be in the spring. As always, Hannah. We have uh, Dr. Tina Dahini. You are, uh, first of all, a lecturer on social work in the super diverse city at uh, Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences. Um, you are, if I'm correct, an avid reader of Hannah Arendt's work. And um, uh, you are here to give us some context on the work of Arendt and Heidegger for those who are uh, less uh, introduced in them. And uh, if I'm correct, you have written a letter to Alan for this occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Good so I hope that uh, you can hear me all. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm not an expert, especially not on Heidegger, but I did read and I used them in my uh, dissertation and my other work. Um, and in line with uh, Dora, I wanted to write a letter to Hannah Arendt, and I'm going to share that letter with you. I hope uh, that's going to make some things clear about the intellectual uh, interaction between the two. Dear, dear Hannah, you are a teacher, a teacher for me, yet I have never met you. 1975, the year you died, the year I was born. My dear Hannah, those who seem to be my people are at war with those who you once said to be your people. We are from different times, different sentiments, different countries and continents. For this world and the way that this world defines relations, well dear dear Hannah, you and I are at best nothing more than strangers. Yet, my teacher, this world has not seen our connectivity. We are both children of war, we are both children of refuge, 
We are both women that do not want to be called by their femininity. I learned to speak with you. I learned to define my pain differently because of you. I learned to observe the roads of exclusion from you. In the conversations that I had in my mind, you and I often did not agree, but we managed to move on in disagreements. We even plea for dispute. We celebrate it for the sake of politics. Politics, Hannah, the world that you and I never define as policy, never get cynical and desperate about it. For us, politics is an open space where difference is allowed, where transformation of who we are appears from within and from without. The space that we love, Amor Mundi, the space of our humanity. Alas, my dear, dear teacher, there are also things that you did not teach me. The space of politics is getting thin. And the disagreement that is pled for is not for the sake of difference. It is for the sake of tradition, homogeneity, angry white men and angry other people. You did not teach me how to make a distinction between disagreement and disagreement. You did not teach me where the limits are. You dare to advocate for a limit with Eichmann. His wish for you not to exist made you wish his non-existence. But you forgot to teach me to handle the millions Eichmanns around me. Talking Eichmanns, shopping Eichmanns, disinterested Eichmanns, voting Eichmanns. Yes, Anna, teaching Eichmanns. We both had teachers, teachers that inspire us, teachers that demotivated us, teachers that we do not even remember, and teachers that gave us an ambiguous sense of existence, teachers that taught us to speak and took words from us at the same time. You know who I'm referring to, Martin, Martin Heidegger. I never cared for your affair. That was not mine to care about. I just care for the price you had to pay more than any other philosopher for your association with him. The man that gave you words to describe your thoughts and did not support you when you needed him the most. Was he an ordinary teacher? Were you an ordinary student? In unlikely times, no one is allowed to be ordinary. You need to make a choice. Where did your choice lie? In his deeds? In his juvenile letters to you? Or in his words, his poetics? I read them too, Hannah, but I read them after the facts. I never met him as innocent as you did. I was charmed, I must admit. Martin, that criticizes our dependence on technology. The man that abhorred the media. The man that pled for the end of men. The end of meaningless discussions. Just turn, turn on the telly. On the, and the fatal combination of men, technology and media is there in its complete nothingness. Martin, that advocated for something else, for a meat saying, a togetherness, where distance is not about a real space, not this useless ethnocentric discussion in between countries and borders, but a meat saying that was effective, stimul, a sense of in-betweenness. Not to be a man or a woman, not being a part of meaningless men, but a Dasein. Being there, just to be, says that you are. Not as a thing, not as a what, not as an identity, a given name, but to be, to be for being itself. Undistancing of yourself from that being there. I just have to imagine your 19 years old eyes, your longing eyes, 
longing for something else, not to be the underestimated girl, Hannah, not to be the orphan, Hannah, not to be the excluded Jew, Hannah. How could you not have not wanted that? That Dasein, that Mitzein, that Stimmel, the sense of being, the sense of belonging. We have all been fools, Hannah. You are no exception. You're just in the picture. And in contrast to what men believe, your adoration in the beginning could not define your attitude as a woman. There is a difference between the girl and the woman. The girl adored the concepts. The woman radically criticized them. The woman observed that there was something individualistic about Heidegger's Dasein. In the essence, the sense of being is for this philosopher a mortal coil. Only by realizing that we are mortal, only in that sense of dying, Heidegger argued, only then one can truly experience its being. It's being there. Heidegger adored death, adored silence, and never fully realized the political impact of mid-sein, in betweenness and the sense of undistancing oneself from one another. Heideggerian Dasein is too self-observed. It does not understand the impact of concepts for the political realm of being. Heidegger's associations with the devils of his time was not something that was not present in his work. It was something in between the lines, in between the choices he made. Many philosophers could not see that. They needed actual proof, historical <coughs> letters. You did not excommunicate him, yet the youthful adoration evolved itself into a critique of his work in the fullest sense. No, I am not walking with the world, Hannah. That is what I learned from you as a woman and as a teacher. I can read your letters, your struggles, but I can also read your books. I do not know who wrote the letters. I do not know how to care for them. But I am certain that the woman in you, Hannah, wrote the books. Your sense of understanding Pollovex was full of deconstruction of your professor's thoughts. Amor mundi, Hannah loving the world of human beings, that is what made you essentially different from your tutor. Unlike Martin, you did not isolate yourself on the top of a mountain to write. You engaged, you reflected, you were honest about the things, and you even dared to make everyone angry for the sake of reflection and truth. You were isolated, but not by choice. In your books, being who we are is not bound to a sense of death, but to a sense of belonging, a sense of community. What makes humans so different from other species is their ability to be born over and over again. Their ability to create other communities, new <coughs> communities, and new versions of themselves. You were not the woman who was in search of an essential truth about our being, but in search of new possibilities. Unlike your so-called mentor, you were not obsessed with mortality, but with natality. Unlike him, you did not celebrate silence, but empowerment, speech, and engagement. Hannah, from adoring the man you turned into the, his teacher. You became the teacher of an unworthy mentor. A mentor that wrote about the essence of fear, the angst, yet helped to create a world that was destructive in fuller sense of the world. A world that made you flee, refuge, a world of hate. Your answer was critical in fuller sense of the world. You did not preach isolation and hatred. 
Some say that that made you weak, perhaps. I do not know. I was not there to ask you. So that judgment is forever gone. I'd rather evaluate you on the things that you wanted to create. You preached respect, friendship, forgiveness. You preached activism and critique for the sake of life and for the sake of the world. Amor Mundi. That was what made you surpass your mentor. A sense of altruism that made you right in 1948. Like virtually all other events of our century, the solution of the Jewish question merely produced a new category of refugees, the Arabs, thereby increasing the number of stateless and rightless for another seven to 800,000 people. Even then, even then after what happened to you, you were capable of thinking beyond the borders, beyond the people you belong to, beyond yourself. I adore you in the fullest sense. I adore you as a woman. And it hurts me to say, Hannah, that besides not teaching me where the limits are, there are some other things that you did not teach me. You did not teach me how to defend you since you were accused and evaluated as a woman. But most of all, you did not teach me how to engage in a conversation that defines people on the merit of their skin color. In your lectures, there's little understanding of the manner in which enslavement of people still defines the lives of millions. So my dear Hannah, also I must surpass thoughts, your thoughts. I must criticize your manner of approach. I never met you, but I am sure, certain, that you would have been fond of my disagreement. I adore you. You are my mentor. And as a mentor, you are way different than Martin. You are not an ambiguous teacher. You are forever worthy inspirer in disagreement. Sincerely yours, Tina. We hear Janet? I'll be here to also help you with questions from the audience. now to open for a debate and a discussion uh, with everybody who wants to. Maybe I will just say a few words uh, that are maybe not, not very clear uh, about the origin of all, origin of, uh, all this. Um, is on the work of uh, made around this book uh, on reconciliation. A few words about how this all happened or how this all started. So there was uh, with the publication of the of the black notebooks uh, of um, uh, Heidegger uh, in the year 2014. There was uh, uh, um, the in, in German and the translation of a big part of them into English. There came again a new wave of discussion in in in, uh, in Freiburg. Uh, about what to do with the heritage of, of, uh, of Heidegger, because there is, uh, of course, there is a, 
a street, there is the Heidegger chair in the university, there is a, a, a whole library, beautiful library dedicated to him, uh, but it is more and uh, harder and harder to get, for instance, grants uh, to study Heidegger. Um, and it is the, the, the one who held the chair of uh, Heidegger uh, resigned uh, from the Heidegger Society and uh, made uh, some proposition that when he retired, they should uh, take away the name Heidegger of his chair. So they started a, a wave of uh, um, uh, voices who wanted, so as to say, erase Heidegger from the memory of, uh, of Heidelberg with the double down uh, uh, paradox that uh, a, a large part of the students, foreign students that come to Heidegger, sorry, to uh, Freiburg, uh, they do it because they want to study uh, Heidegger and they want to study in the Heidegger chair. So in this, uh, in this kind of climate, uh, uh, there was a, a, an offer or an invitation to, uh, to work in, um, around this uh, polemic in the, um, in the kind of uh, gallery for contemporary art uh, in Freiburg, and then I started uh, to um, well read about it and uh, focus on the concept of reconciliation, as it was enunciated with uh, Hannah Arendt. I'm going to read the, the letters uh, that had been published a long time ago, um, and I decided that I would use the relationship of uh, Hannah and. Uh, and uh, Hannah Arendt and Martin Heidegger, and especially this concept of reconciliation that was written by Hannah Arendt actually in, in her um, philosophic uh, diary in the Tagebuch, uh, <coughs> maybe two days after he met, she met again uh, Heidegger. Uh, so I was convinced that there is obviously a relation. Uh, she created this concept for in order to um, justifies maybe not the occult words, but in order to uh, understand uh, her fidelity to him and her uh, wish or her willingness to, to establish again a relation. So in the in the in the, uh, the the letters are divided in three parts in the in all the in the book of the letters. One that is called the bleak, the Peru bleak, and uh, autumn. I think like the look, they say the, the, the look back and the and autumn. The look is the moment when they have the affair when uh, <coughs> is nineteen. Martin Heidegger is seventy five. Uh, they have this uh, uh, affair that actually doesn't last very long because very quickly. Heidegger decides when he's about to publish uh, Bean and uh, and. Uh, um, Hold on a second. Time and being. Uh, time and being uh, decides that maybe it's not uh, it's not uh, so so as to uh, it's not uh, an it's an obstacle. Hannah Arendt becomes an obstacle, and he quickly advises advises her to go away to study with uh, Jaspers, and then uh, um, afterwards uh, she marries, uh, and then uh, she has to escape, that is the moment of this uh, important letter of 1933, when uh, she kind of, uh, right after two years almost, she writes back to him to ask for some explanation of the rumors uh, that uh, circulate about his antisemitism. And then she goes uh, to be a refugee, first to Paris, and, uh, and uh, she oh. escapes uh, and goes, uh, ends up in, in, in the United States. And there becomes, uh, at the moment in the 1950s, uh, she is now um, a famous um, essayist, and he is a paria. So he has uh, turned around, the thing turns around. And even if she has no need to look him up, uh, she does. And in this letter, uh, where she says that at uh, that moment, uh, she felt uh, when the name of uh, him uh, started to be um, uh, pronounced by the waiter, asking like uh, Miss Harent, uh, <coughs> is here to see you. Uh, she could have decided to play deaf, and uh, but then she decided to acknowledge, and it was like the moment of uh, a second when her entire life is uh, decided, and then from that uh, it comes this. Um, well, you can imagine that he must have been doing something to meet his wife. Uh, Heidegger wants Anna, Hara to meet his wife. Uh, it was a real, according to everyone, that was a real nasty one. Uh, and uh, uh, there is this kind of, uh, I can imagine, rather uh, awkward meeting between the three of them. Uh, and then from then on, uh, she goes to uh, try to publish and to help her. Uh, Martin Heidegger in this moment when he was uh, he was not published and he was not allowed to teach and all this, 
And then afterwards, it evolves uh, as like a real friendship between the two couples, uh, um, also with the uh, husband of Aaron, uh, until the moment when Harry <coughs> dies. Uh, and uh, that is the last letter that we read when the wife of the husband of, uh, of Hannah Arendt dies. And then there are a few uh, totally, um, uh, how do you say, irrelevant letters, and then she dies before him uh, of a heart attack in 75. So this is the kind of, uh, um, uh, these are the letters that are uh, be taken in the book, uh, transcribed and with, uh, with the manuscripts that you see there. And then uh, there is a series of people, um, there's a conversation between uh, Simona Asensio, uh, Adriana Wilford Jensen and me on this kind of performance, on the, the idea of uh, the, to have the reading of the letters turn into a discussion on this kind of, uh, uh, on this, um, Friendship, but especially uh, for us, what was is more uh, fundamental or the fundamental point here is the question of moral responsibility of intellectuals. As you were saying in your uh, in your letter, uh, how much uh, the moral um, the behavior of intellectuals uh, can uh, color or decide our understanding of the work, how much the um, for the positions of Martin Heidegger, uh, is that a reason to ban Heidegger from the university? Is that a reason to stop reading Heidegger? Um, especially now, of course, uh, in the time that this book is published, in the time of the Me Too, uh, this is our questions that are have a new, a new light uh, of many, of many <coughs> men, powerful men uh, that uh, have been now for the first time held accountable. Uh, what to do with the work of these men? And uh, so this, uh, here we have Rebecca Thor, Nikola Mirkovic, Anna Sophia Springer, Mark Thomas, Julia Tuserova, Etienne Turpin, uh, that have contributed to the essays uh, to, this, uh, to this question, and especially to uh, make this question contemporary. So this is what uh, the book, uh, with the book is. And uh, this is what the discussion uh, is about. And uh, I don't know, do you want to say something? I guess there's questions from the audience, but otherwise I can start off with uh, with one maybe to frame uh, frame the conversation. Um, please, everyone, join in if you if you have any questions. Same goes for you. Um, but I was uh, reading uh, uh, the publication, and uh, one of the core statements I think that you give is uh, the question: Can the work of thinkers or artists uh, be independent from their political opinions? Um, um, and from that, I was I was wondering because I think you were already thinking about that question way before you were specifically working on this specific correspondence. Um, if you look into this, let's say, love letters over this long period of time, it's it's a various, uh, it's a very am ambiguous. Um, um, source, let's say, to look into these questions. So I'm super curious why you chose something as ambiguous as a, as a correspondence between two people that maybe leave 80% of what they're thinking outside of what they're writing because they already know what they're talking about um, to investigate this question of uh, someone's personal beliefs versus their, let's say, official body of work. Microphone. There is something wrong with the microphones. No, it's, it's hard to understand. I don't know. I don't know why. It's very loud. So, as I said, I would like. Can you repeat the question? Yes, yes. The fundamental question, the central question that you asked. Why did you choose letters to and not the intellectual works? Uh, to make this point exactly. The point being? The point being, what is your responsibility as an intellectual and your political opinion? Well, uh, of course, we, there is a, stand, there is a, a wide uh, body of work. I was not, uh, so I have uh, this, uh, apart from this, I started to read Heidegger. I have read Hannah Arendt, I have not read uh, Heidegger. Uh, I was, uh, um, uh, in the case of Hannah Arendt, uh, to me, it was always clear that her whole life, her whole intellectual work was devoted to try to understand what had happened. So those years that go from 33 
to the, the years where she did not write to Martin, uh, the years between 53 and 50, uh, all the work is about understanding how that was possible. Uh, how could this happen? Uh, in the famous interview that she did for the German television, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry because I'm very tired and it's hard for me to remember, but it is a uh, um, language, is, uh, I don't know how it's called, but there is this famous interview where she describes. Uh, what is this? Uh, there was a name. The last interview. Uh, one of, yes. No, no, yeah, about. Uh, 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 Language is the last thing that remains. Yeah, so. yeah language, but that's what remains, yes. So, and she says uh, this thing that is, uh, um, that they see, they knew, they, they knew what, uh, what was really uh, uh, chilling for her as a, as a young intellectual in Germany at that time, uh, having been uh, in the, at the center of all things, was not what the Nazis did, uh, because she expected that they knew who the Nazis were. What was absolutely chilling is what people who were not Nazis did. So what they said, how all of a sudden you disappear, all of a sudden people did not talk to you, and how all of a sudden you were not part of anything, how all of a sudden it's like they did not see you. That's why also this letter is especially revealing when she speaks about this game that she played with her mother, um, where uh, the mother did as if she did not recognize you, and did recognize her, and she started to cry and say, but it's me, it's, it's Johanna, and your daughter, and this feeling that all of a sudden they were not there anymore, that they were not part of what they had been part, part of. So uh, when you, uh, in reading the letters, then I thought uh, these letters between Hannah Arendt and Martin Heidegger, they really are almost uh, a century, it's a whole century is, uh, is in, uh, in, in those letters. And they are very interesting because you, you have like very good subjects. You have, of course, philo the philosophy, the discussions of philosophy. You also have a little bit, the, the, of course, the background of history, the re reference to Jasper, for instance, but he sends, uh, literally Martin Heidegger sends uh, Hannah Arendt to study with Jasper, and the wife of Jasper was Jewish. And then um, uh, um, Heidegger stopped going to the house of Jasper because uh, the, the wife was Jewish and somehow also did not do anything to help them to, uh, to navigate through the, even if they stayed in Germany, to navigate this, uh, those years um, in, uh, during, the, during the Nazi time. Um, I somehow lost what I was going to say. So it's very important uh, from the big point of view, the big uh, subjects, but it's also very interesting from the small parts. So the relation between a man and a woman. Somehow it is so, it is almost like a twice told story. You already can imagine what is going to happen. You have the letters of the, the with these funny expressions because after all we're in the twenties, about that the he you have to forgive my behavior in the in the during the walk. You can imagine what happened in the walk. Uh, all this about the demonic struck me, so all these kind of uh, uh, funny references about their, their um, sexual relation. And then after, afterwards, uh, how the thing gets uh, cooler and cooler until it's uh, mostly Hannah who's writing, and Hannah is longing for Heidegger, and Heidegger all of a sudden doesn't seem to be half time for her. And then you can imagine all these uh, thousands of stories you have heard of these kind of relationships between teachers and students, and how all of a sudden it is not uh, interesting anymore. And then she, but um, uh, then uh, you have this uh, meeting again when she uh, is important for him and where he needs her and how uh, this kind of uh, comic uh, really, uh, encounter with his wife. So there again it is a kind of situation that you also recognize this kind of uh, pitiful uh, man uh, that is trying to make his life bearable just by introducing uh, his mistress to his wife uh, so as to have some sort of normality go back to, to his life. Uh, and then it goes on and then for a long time they, there is a big gap in their, in their writing just because Elfride was too jealous uh, to allow Martin to write to Hannah and Hannah had no time uh, for Martin because Hannah had a very happy marriage. Uh, she was very happy with, uh, with uh, her second husband, had a very full time and a very full life. And nevertheless, she wanted, she felt this kind of loyalty to, towards uh, Heidegger. And there is a lot of mansplaining, and there is a lot of, uh, um, uh, uh, he never acknowledged her, her as an equal intellectually. He, she only existed to him as an admirer. And for some reason, she did not uh, thought it worth to, to fight that battle. And she thought it was okay. It was. Uh, she has this kind of bitter uh, uh, letter where she says that I would have dedicated the book to you uh, if we had uh, um, 
I don't remember anymore how it was kind of expressing between us. Uh, and uh, there is another letter that is not in the in the book uh, or in the reading, where he says to her more or less, "Thanks for the book. Uh, I won't read it because I have no time, but I hope I think my wife will find it interesting." <laughs> <laughs> so there, this kind of extremely uh, uh, humiliating uh, uh, stuff uh, and. Uh, uh, they say, when you read the letters to Jasper, they, they are really delicious because there uh, she says things that she doesn't tell Martin, where uh, uh, he, um, she says something like, uh, yeah, it's very funny, uh, Heidegger seems to get so irritated when someone mentions that I'm able to write the O, the letter O, and uh, he just gets uh, extremely impatient and wants to go and, and, uh, and talk about something as quickly because he could, really, he could not, he could not uh, uh, suffer admiration for Hannah Arendt. So the moment someone manifested the, the how great she was and how interesting was what she was doing, he immediately wanted to, to change subject because he, I guess Hannah in special, but also anybody else uh, for him, everybody, he was the only great one. And uh, then um, uh, in the time that they are both old, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, that's the moment <coughs> when the post French post-structuralists start to visit Heidegger and you have these photographs of, uh, of him with Lacan, and uh, um, so he's uh, recovered for many people, and uh, there is this funny letter between uh, Watari and Deleuze, where Deleuze, uh, he says, it always has to happen to philosophy. I, I quote by memory, so I don't know. But more he says, it would have happened in literature, it could have happened in, in, uh, um, in poetry, but of course it had to happen to philosophy. We had to have the Nazi one. We got the Nazi shame one. Of, the shame <laughs> of philosophy, yes. Yeah, the shame, we got the Nazi. Um, uh, um, but uh, apparently for them, uh, uh, it was, uh, I mean, they would never have erased the memory of Heidegger. Heidegger was super important for, for them, uh, for the French, for the French way on, on top, they all declared themselves communists and this kind of thing, but uh, Heidegger was too important for them. And then, um, you know, well, so that's uh, the answer to the question about the letters. That's why, because the letters, they are so useful to talk about all these things, uh, to talk about the big and to talk about the small, uh, to talk about the, the especially why, uh, the, the whole mystery why, why Hannah Arendt stayed uh, uh, faithful to the memory of Heidegger. Uh, Hannah Arendt didn't know about the black notebooks, uh, but she obviously knew uh, that he was a Nazi. And uh, she always knew, and uh, she was aware of the speech uh, that he gave as a rector, praising uh, Hitler. Um, but I, when you read the letters of Jasper, there's a lot of humor uh, regarding that. When she says, well, apparently um, the Nazis were not Nazi enough for Heidegger because they, <laughs> they, they was very quickly, they fell out of love very quickly, uh, the Nazi party and Heidegger, uh, because the Nazis thought uh, that he was too complicated after all, and that they preferred other, uh, other philosophers. Uh, for, and, and for him, they failed in their ambition. They were not ambitious enough. They were mediocre. They were, it's true, they were mediocre people. But, um, and then another thing that is comes from the letter and it is very funny is how provincial Heidegger is. So how uh, completely idiotic to the world uh, and how, uh, um, how you say, cosmopolitan Hannah Arendt is. So Hannah Arendt is always writing from Paris, from London, from this, and he's always writing from uh, this little <laughs> house in Helsinkirchen, <laughs> always writing from Helsinkirchen. And uh, so that's also something that is quite uh, that is quite interesting uh, to me. So yes, this is uh, they let us help uh, allow you to talk about many different things, other things that maybe uh, using the word would not be possible. <coughs> maybe someone wants to uh, join in with a question already. Oh, in the back. Can you maybe shout? The court is definitely too short. Thank you. 
Do you know what the first? Yeah, what the first thing was that uh, people told me about Hannah Arendt uh, uh, at the universities. Indeed, small sentences. Is uh, was I was reading her and I was going like, uh, do you know anything about Hannah Arendt? And it was like, oh, you mean the Heidegger's girl? So we could read those letters, but we could also in in philosophy the answers change, the questions don't change, the questions remain. How, in which way, in which manner we are excluding people or uh, sexes or unethical or uh, uh, whatever the, the letter you wrote, people are exactly talking about her in that manner today in the academia. So my question is not was Heidegger a, uh, you know, a bad guy or whatever, he was a complex guy and he was also a bad guy, but who are the bad guys now? We are always busy with history. We are always busy with history, but not with the sentences now. And I think that that is what I learned from Arendt. You know, uh, the, the quote I, uh, I, uh, I read for you, it was about what are we doing now? Not what are we doing in the history, but what are we doing now? Who are the next refugees? Who are the next excluded ones? Who are the next people who are silenced? And that is what I learned from her. So that would be a kind of very short answer to your very big question, I think. Yes, Mark, I, I, I couldn't add more. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting to look back uh, in, uh, to the past, let's say, to try to understand, because, uh, for instance, um, when I was uh, involved in all the discussions in, uh, in, uh, in Freiburg, on, uh, you know, we did these discussions, and there was always someone who started screaming, I don't even know how we can discuss Heidegger, that's fucking nasty, <coughs> we should never pronounce his name again. And uh, so I was uh, shocked by the by how um, violent it was uh, sometimes, but I was also thinking, you know, it's, it's of course it's very hard for us to imagine. Uh, it's easy to condemn Nazis now, it, it, now those Nazis. It's okay. easy to condemn now those Nazis. It is hard to condemn the Nazis now, uh, and they are everywhere. There are Nazis everywhere. It's uh, all of a sudden. Uh, I mean, not, probably not, but <laughs> they are shameless Nazis. Uh, and uh, so um, we are quick to judge Heidegger, and we are quick to judge uh, uh, the people in the 30s, and we can imagine uh, ourselves as heroes that we should certainly have fought uh, uh, those things, but we are not fighting those things now. And uh, so in that sense, I find it a bit uh, self-righteous, this kind of condemnation of things that are past when you are, don't bring yourself to condemn. Those things now are to do uh, actively do something for those things now because to me it's uh, really uh, heartbreaking uh, to see, you know, the, the monsters that are coming to power. They have been voted by people, and I just cannot understand. And uh, uh, so, in that sense, uh, um, even if it is not entirely true, the famous sentence that they say that that uh, Hitler came to power because of voting. I mean, there's no doubt they like it. Right? They, who did you say Hitler? I mean. <laughs> they, the people adore Hitler. Really, they, they really love. Yeah, they really love Hitler, and that's what was so. I can't imagine that was was so horrible for many people and for Hannah and among, among others. How uh, you could have such devotion uh, from uh, from Germany. So this is what I mean. It is easy to to play uh, the righteous person now uh, to, towards events that are already past and that have been proven. Uh, who was the bad guy? Who was the good guy? And but now, of course, uh, this is what uh, what uh, what is necessary to be able to 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 judge and to uh, so this this book of Hannah Arendt, for instance, Men in Dark Times, which uh, notoriously did not include Heidegger, 
which is very interesting because uh, the point was he wanted to find out how men behave in those difficult years, what was their take uh, in the things that were happening. And it is indeed, uh, it is the present uh, where we have to exercise our the judgment, the, the question of political judgment can only be exercised in the present, I think. It cannot be exercised backwards. Can I ask you something? What I was also wondering is, why did no one look at the letters from her to Jaspers and from Jaspers to her? That was another teacher, another relation, more productive. Uh, uh, if, if, if we call someone Aaron's teacher, it's Jasper, mm -hmm. because it was in fullest sense of the word. He was the man of his words. So why do you think that we are so obsessed with her relation with Heidegger and so less obsessed with her relation with Jaspers? Well, obviously we are obsessed uh, with the relation because, they because he sex. was a Nazi and she was a Jew. And, uh, no. and also because they had sex. Yeah, it's probably. Simple. Yeah, I mean, probably. I mean, it's of for course, us but the, very the, shocking that you have sex with your teacher, but uh, trust me, as people went in, in, in the 50s, Everyone had sex with their teachers, so it's, she, she was not even an exception. Well, I mean, that's, uh, of course, there's a part of it, uh, indeed, and uh, when you see there are many, there are even, um, uh, uh, how you say, uh, films and uh, um, uh, radio plays which focus on, on, the, on the relation, but uh, I mean, you think they had sex very short, so, <laughs> it's a very small part. <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> I mean, there is a very small part of sexual intercourse in the whole relation. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, it was about one year. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but from the letters, you the news it was very short because very quickly already with the letters they exchanged in the first uh, in the first one <laughs> in the twenties, uh, she was already um, gone and to Jasper's and she already had other relationships and uh, even if as she explains to Mrs. Heidegger, she was not uh, she thought she would never love anybody. Uh, the fact is that she was not uh, um, in a relation with Heidegger at the moment. So it's a uh, this but there is of course a fascination for that, but there's also I think undoubtedly there's a fascination because it's notoriously uh, an intellectual Jew, and he's not usually a Nazi, and that's fascinating. Okay, we go with that argument. He's a Nazi and she's a Jew. But still, why are we interested with that contrast and not with the person who stood up, who fought for her? Why are we not obsessed with man and woman that tried very hard to create something else? You know what yeah, I, but mean? I mean? Obsession so we are also obsessed with the negative and not with the affirmative, the other, well, the other I, side of politics. If I speak for myself, uh, I, I am interested in the letters to, uh, to Jasper. I have read letters to Jasper. It's absolutely in, uh, very important to read the letters to Jasper to understand the, the letters to Martin Heidegger. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a completely different relationship between uh, uh, she and Jasper and she mm -hmm. and Martin Heidegger. Indeed, uh, there is a, a com comradeship. Uh, there, is, there is a real unequal, they are equals which is probably what a teacher should be, uh, is they are really equals when they talk to each other. They kind of speak about uh, everything they want. Uh, there is a big openness. Uh, there is a real friendship, while here there is always something very dark and very uh, hidden. And there is never, it's always hierarchical. It's never, she also doesn't seem to be interested in changing the hierarchy. Um, but I think there is, a, a, because I'm interested in paradoxes and because probably from the point of view of the paradox uh, is a more interesting relation because it's extremely paradoxical. Um, why uh, the most, parad for me, the, the, the really the note of the paradox is in that letter from 1950 when she decides to answer the call. Uh, when she didn't need to answer the call, uh, when she certainly must have a lot of uh, things to um, dislike Heidegger, not only because of his uh, of politics, but also because of personal things. I mean, he was he was a pig from every sense of the world. In that's uh, from a personal uh, sense of the. So why does he decide to answer? What what she speaks all the time about? Uh, she speaks all the time about faithfulness. Uh, and she speaks all the time of of the the mission. Like she has a mission with Heidegger. Which I can imagine this is something that only can originate uh, in your teenage. So only as a teenager you decide that you miss, you have, uh, that man is the one who starts to say, made you. 
and uh, and you uh, owe that to him or whatever the cost. So it's a bit the love. It's a bit like the beauty of the beast. Uh, why the beast uh, is always there? Um, so in that sense, it's interesting because it's para paradoxical. And when you speak about obsession, obsession is always towards something that is obscure. The things that are. Uh, light and beautiful and uh, uh, it's just an interest, but the obsession is really to uh, try to understand something that is almost impossible to understand. I don't want to be annoying, but I think that Jasper more, was more obscure in his time by resisting. Yeah, but I mean to her, the relation to her, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Did you read the letters to her, to Jasper? Uh, this, you can you think of uh, two friends, there are two friends and they are, as I say, openly, the things that she tells to Jasper, she will never tell to Heidegger. She speaks openly about the relation to Heidegger. There is this delicious moment when she tells Heidegger, she tells Jasper that she had an affair with Heidegger, and the answer of Jasper is, oh, how very exciting it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there is really a, it's, it's a, a sweet, uh, it's a beautiful relation also with the wife of Jasper. And so, in a sense, um, it is uh, it is very interesting. I don't know about the other people. Uh, what is attracting to me of the relation to Heidegger is the paradox of uh, in it. Great. <coughs> um, we're uh, nearing the, the the closing time, but um, if anyone has any uh, pressing last questions, then this is the the time. Uh, that's nice to end with you. Thank you. Um, there's something in, in the letter that kind of um, intrigues me, but I'm not, I, I, I need to find the words. Can you help me? You said something about um, reading in between the lines for Heidegger's work. You could already read it. Uh, I can't remember the sentence you, you wrote exactly, um, but what do you mean by that? Um, uh, one of them is the melody describes the girl that you become your dark side. And your dark side is from your dark side when you are experiencing death, the, 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 the ending. And when you are aware of your ending, because human beings are the only species that are aware of, of uh, mm -hmm. the ending. And your ending, you are purely alone. You are uh, all alone. On yourself, and then you realize your dark side. So it's very minimalistic. And the passages before that, he's talking about Nietzsche and togetherness, uh, and, uh, and uh, things like that. Natality for Aaron is very uh, in between. Natality, when you are born, you are actually in between two people. Well, at least two people, the baby and the mother. And if it's okay, the father or the other mother is also there. But um, for Heidegger, all that means that he defines himself through Darsai. Darsai defines himself in complete loneliness. Mm -hmm. but do you, do, is it what you wanted to say there that that's, uh, if, if you read between the lines these things, what you're saying now, then we would have understood before what kind of person he was? Or? No, I mean more literally that we have to stop getting reading between the lines. It's, I think what you are trying to say, even between my lines, I think a hundred years from now that people would discover things that I write has been excused in those things. So and we, do, we, we always um, wait for something else to see uh, uh, between the lines. You see my type of super diversity. Everybody is enthusiastic about it. I hate my name. You know why? Because it's very good and diverse for diverse people and blah blah blah. But it was like for decades that people was for trying to say uh, don't uh, categorize people uh, because of their color or heterosexual things or because of their sexuality or whatever. But three heterosexual white males write the work super diversity and now it's in it. Everybody loves it. And no one sees the, the whole spectrum of decades of discussions about the matter. So that's also between the lines. It's not, not, there's nothing wrong with the, for those guys, but there's something wrong with our ears. We are hearing some kind of things 
and other things, other people who do not do that. And that's always been so realized. Heidegger started this whole book that I'm going to tell you something no one did. I'm the Superman. That's philosophy. You want to see the history of philosophy? It's man pumping himself and telling people, I know everything and you know nothing. Even in that, uh, you know, creating a certain expectation in yourself, like I'm, I'm, I know the truth and other people don't. That's, that's, I love philosophy. I never regretted studying philosophy, but that's something within philosophy that we have to you know, resist. And it's also between the lives of Heidegger, it's between the lives of Hegel, it's between the lives of Arendt, it's between the lives of Deleuze and Guattari. You write for equality. Have you read Deleuze? No one can read Deleuze. <coughs> it's like breaks your neck. What kind of intellect, equality, transpiration, uh, uh, transparency? Or uh, communication, it doesn't communicate. That's also between the lines. So it was the same with Heidegger. There is always something that does not communicate or does not agree. So that's what I mean to read the lines. Yeah. 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 Just jumping on what you were saying, what could be then a modern philosopher that is more open? That means something. I mean, someone that could be taking an example. Um, um, uh, his example? No, I mean, um, the contemporary discourse of philosophy. What could be the philosopher that... I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm trying very hard to, uh, uh, to create disputes with myself. Ah. If I'm standing in a classroom, I hope that, this, that they disagree with me. That's what I loved about her and Aaron. Once uh, some interviewer asked her, she said, he said, there is an, uh, a controversy in your thoughts because you, you said that and now you're saying something else. You know what her reaction was? <laughs> Thank God, I'm not a totalitarian. <laughs> so that's the mentality I hope to create uh, along with her. Like, I don't want to be the one who knows best. I just want to think, think together. That's what I want to do. I don't want to know it best. I don't know it best. There are people who know other things than me. So that's not a problem. But that's the problem of philosophy, inherent to philosophy. We want to know everything best. We want to be the smartest guy in the room, or woman, or whatever. Are you saying it's inherent in philosophy? It's, it's in the tradition of philosophy. Okay. See discussions in philosophy, we don't, you, you started with debate. I don't want to have a debate, I want to have a dialogue. But in philosophy, you always have a debate. It's always, but you know, I have read that in that book. Who cares? So you read it. Mm -hmm. Just tell me about it and tell me what you learned. Have you not read that book? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's also a problem of attitude. And I think philosophy also teaches us, that's why I love philosophy, it also teaches you something about your attitude towards the world. And I think that's what you are trying to say. You are writing something, but what is your attitude towards the world? And how do you become responsible for that? Arendt was responsible for her attitude, and she was excluded, but in a very different way than Heidegger. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Tina and Dora. <laughs> for those that are uh, curious to uh, read more uh, from this conversation or read between the lines, we have a few copies of uh, Dora's publication. Um, we ordered uh, a bunch more, but they are uh, in late, so we have about four or five now. So come quick if you want to have them. But within a few days, we'll have more. So um, I think they're quite difficult to, um, to order uh, online from the Netherlands. So uh, just come here if you want one more. Okay, thank you.